Um, welcome to this year's uh, Global Middle Ages Seminar. Uh, my name is Francois Lou. I teach Chinese art and material culture here at the Bart Graduate Center. And it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Bu Yun Chen. Professor Chen is Assistant Professor of Chinese History at Swarthmore College. She holds a PhD in East Asian Languages and Cultures from Columbia University, where she worked with um, Dorothy Coe and uh, Bob Himes, I think. And um, she completed a dissertation there on fashion in the Tang Dynasty. This project has now blossomed into her first monograph, which has just appeared a few months ago, Empire of Style, Silk and Fashion in Tang China. It appeared with the University of Washington Press. She'll also speak to us on this topic tonight. Um, but I want to mention a bit uh, about her current research, which is quite a bit of a shift um, all the way to the 16th to 18th centuries. She's looking at crafts production in the Ryukyu Islands. So uh, still interested in studying the formation and translation of technical knowledge in light of international trade, um, but in a quite different regional context and a much different time. Um, so tonight she will talk to us about crafting cosmopolitanism in Tang, China, 618 to 907. So welcome, Wu Chen. Um, thank you, Francois, for such a generous introduction. Um, so today's talk is drawn from my work on fashion in Tang Dynasty China, but I will not actually focus too much on fashion. Um, my research broadly explores the rich material and symbolic world in Tang China, in which what people wore and how they wore it were foundational to lived experience a world that was both cosmopolitan and fashionable, but in my talk today, I will focus specifically on silk production, the labor, skills, and knowledge of textile artisans, um, and how the work of silk artisans was critical to the maintenance of the Tang Empire as both cosmopolitan and fashionable. So um, to begin, I thought I would briefly sketch the contours of Tang cosmopolitanism through looking at uh, the material artifacts of the empire before moving on to silk. Um, commonly regarded as the cosmopolitan golden age of Chinese history, I think in successive polls of um, Chinese nationals, the Tang Dynasty is consistently voted as the most glorious age. Um, the dynasty was marked by impressive economic growth, political innovations, the flourishing of art and culture, and increased contact with the outside world. At the height of Tang rule, the capital of Chang'an was the largest city in the medieval world and home to over one million residents. The empire became a major sphere of influence within and beyond what is now modern Central and East Asia, absorbing and facilitating commercial intellectual, religious, and artistic exchange across territories. So um, as you see here, it's a, it's a painting attributed to Yan Li Ben. Um, the painting depicts the procession of 27 foreign tribute bearers in the capital of Chang'an in 631 during the reign of Emperor Taizong. What connected Tang China to the wider world is what is known as the Silk Road. Silk Road. Um, coined in 1877 by a German geographer, the Silk Road has become a shorthand for a network of overland trade routes that linked the Tang capital of Chang'an in the east, which is circled there in red, um, to Antioch in the west. In the Tang Dynasty, the Silk Road stretched westward from Chang'an across the Hexi Corridor to the oasis states along the Tarim Basin. At Zhongfang, a city situated in the western end, 
of today's Gangsu province, travelers could either take the northern or southern route around the Takumakan Desert into the western regions, which spanned modern Xinjiang, parts of modern day Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. The two routes converged in Kashgar, near the border of Tajikistan, from where travelers could continue to move west toward Samarkand or south toward India. From Samarkand, the route extended further west, terminating in modern day Turkey. Just to give you a sense of the breadth of these routes that moved peoples and goods. Um, the most prominent manifestation of the Tang Empire's cosmopolitanism and its specific place in the Silk Road network was perhaps the kaftan-like robes, cuffed trousers, riding boots, and elaborate hats that had filtered into the empire from west via the Silk Road trading routes. During the early Tang Dynasty, foreign territorial influence, as you see here in this tomb figurine, can be best described as a pastiche, a pastiche of Turkic, Uyghur, Sogdian, and by extension, Sasanian, dress styles. Um, and what is associated with these dress styles includes an open front jacket with narrow fitting sleeves paired with tapered trousers and trousers that are often striped. So some variation of what you see here. Fascination with foreign dress was linked to the popularity of equestrian outings and sports, as well as foreign music, dance and goods that were all readily consumed by Tang dynasty elites. Um, for example, depictions of foreign attired figurines have been excavated in large numbers from elite tombs and they appear in a myriad of scenes as hunters on horseback, as entertainers, and as attendants alongside other female attendants. As seen here, a group of five female musicians on horseback playing instruments. Now, what is remarkable about this group is that each figure and horse is dressed differently. The women's robes, hats, and instruments are distinct, as are the saddle covers of their horses. The most significant and substantial proof of cultural and technological exchange, however, was uncovered in Hajatun or Haja village, a suburb of modern Xi'an. Um, over 200 gold and silver vessels and nearly 500 gold, silver, and copper coins were buried alongside precious gems. This eight petal silver cup features a composition of four scenes of women at leisure, alternating with four scenes of men hunting on the outer body of the cup. The striking resemblance to murals of palace women, as well as other tomb art, as well as hunting scenes found in Tang, Imperial, and other elite tombs, places the cup within the aesthetic milieu of 8th century Tang dynasty elites and suggests a local production site. The cup's form, however, puts it in closer relation to Sogdian or Sasanian silverware, as seen here next to an octagonal, octagonal cup with ring handle dated to the 8th century in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Cosmopolitanism, as experienced in the Tang Dynasty, was mediated by material desires and sensory experiences of the body. So the eight-petal cup, together with the other treasures of the Hajatuan Horde, constituted a microcosm of the glorious Tang Empire, a miscellany of materials, motifs, and techniques of ambiguous origins consolidated in a single site, a veritable melting pot. This exchange was made material across space, but also across mediums. One could perhaps argue that the mark of this era is the great intermediate or the depth of intermediality shared between gold and silverware, as well as glassware, textiles, and painting. Now, as a cosmopolitan empire, Tang China did not only absorb influence from beyond its borders, artists, artisans, and weavers within the empire participated and contributed to the production of a distinct cosmopolitan style, a distinct Tang cosmopolitan style, most notably in the stylized depictions of Tang palace women at leisure, 
seated or standing beneath trees, as seen here in a rubbing taken from a stone sarcophagus of the tomb of Consort Wu Huifei, who died in 737. She was the um, favorite of Tang Xuanzong before she was usurped by um, the famous Yang Guifei. This pictorial trope, Women Under Trees, came to dominate 8th century painting um, and fundamental to the coherence of this trope was the figure of the Tang beauty, plump face, plump bodied, draped in silk with hair piled high. Um, the Tang beauty constituted in many ways a template, a form to be styled. The template of the Tang beauty traveled along open roads or more precisely the Silk Road trading routes contributing to a vernacular convention of figure painting from Turfan in modern Xinjiang to Nara, Japan. So we see here um, one screen of six from the Wei family tomb dated to the mid eighth century, located outside of Chang'an. Um, it is one of six contiguous screens enclosing female figures positioned under trees um, that were painted on a wall as well as here, a finding in Astana tomb number 187. Um, it is one of the restored screen paintings from this tomb, which included 11 images of women and children. Um, so these standing women are framed around two women seated playing a game of Go, um, also dated to the mid eighth century. And finally, we have here um, a contemporaneous set of six folding screens uncovered in Nara, Japan, known as Folding Screen of Standing Women with Bird Flowers, which has survived in the collection of the Shosoin. Dated to the mid 8th century, the women in the screens bear a close resemblance to Ufuifei's figures. So from here, I'm going to move on to silk production. Um, or silk more broadly, in an empire where silk was the dominant measure of value, it was critical to the articulation of power by emperor and subject alike. In Tang China, silk production was foundational to the exercise of imperial power. Collected as tax and used as a form of currency, plain weave silks were ubiquitous throughout the empire delivered as tribute, regional silk textiles guaranteed the link between court and periphery, offered as gifts and political exchanges, plain and decorated silks were instrumental in brokering alliances and demonstrating the empire's wealth. As the materials for imperial and official regalia, silk functioned to distinguish the emperor from his subjects and elites from non-elites. The value of silk measured by the complexity of its design and by the brilliance of its color, served an important role in social and political hierarchies. Um, what you see here are fragments from the Stein collection in the V&A. These fragments are representative of the spectrum of dyed plain and tool damask textiles found in Duongfang, and they provide a sense of the richly colored sart sartorial world of the Tang Empire. Distinctions between official and non-official ranks and, be, and within official ranks were regulated according to the color of one's dress, as well as silk weave and pattern. In other words, the status of the wearer was linked to the value of her wardrobe. In the world of fashion, silks maintained the same function of making the clothed body both valuable and current. Um, and this is a figure that might be familiar to many of you. She has been exhibited in, um, in many places. So this figurine of a female dancer was produced for the burial of Lady Chu of Turfan in an oasis city located along the Silk Road. The figurine, however, was crafted in Chang'an after her death in 688. So this dancer, traveled over a thousand miles from the capital to the western frontier of the empire to be buried in a joint tomb shared by Lady True's husband. And she is dressed up in the fashionable silks of the seventh century. 
The dancer's striped skirt and resist dyed shawl, two staple patterning techniques found on both representations of Tong Palace women and excavated silk artifacts, situated her among her 7th century contemporaries in the capital. Her belt is the earliest example of kasi, literally translated as carved silk or silk tapestry weave, and her short sleeve top featuring two pearl roundels enclosing confronted birds call attention to her cosmopolitan status. Kusu, for example, was an innovation in silk weaving that was adapted from wool tapestry techniques local to West and Central Asia and likely emerged from exchanges from between textile artisans on the Northwestern frontier. The roundel pattern, as you see here, um, assumed to have originated in Sasanian Iran, became a dominant motif in textile design across the territories of the Silk Road during the seventh and eighth centuries, stretching from Nara, Japan to Byzantium. I will talk, I will focus um, primarily on the roundel or medallion style for the rest of my talk, but just briefly, um, Viewed together, if we look at this figure, the dancer's ensemble established her as a subject of an increasingly interconnected world in which Tang court style combined with colors, textures, and motifs imported and adapted from multiple locales. Such was the power of ornament that led the ninth century poet Zheng Gu to remark, quote, when cloth is plain, grand families will certainly not even look at it. Without decorative patterns, it is hard to keep up with the times, end quote. From Zheng's perspective, to be all current or to keep up with the times was to possess patterned silks. Silk design and technology was both the innovative force underpinning the Tang fashion system, as well as key, even critical to the empire's imperial and cosmopolitan ambitions. To be fashionable and cosmopolitan thus depended on the skills and productivity of weavers and in an expanding silk industry. So during the first century of Tang rule, an extensive system of workshops um, inherited from the previous dynasty was established to facilitate the production of complex silk textiles for imperial use. So what I've charted for you here are the 10 workshops that were under the direct supervision of the Directorate of Imperial Manufactories. Um, as you can see, eight were de dedicated to the weaving of different silks, one dedicated to bast fiber or plant fiber, which would include hemp or rainy, and one for animal hair. The courts and local administrations continued investment in silk production along with increased trade and continued demand for textiles, broadened the geographical scope of silk production and fostered major innovations in technique and design. In this way, the imperial tax and tribute system, an institution that was key to the survival of Tang rule, also provided the framework for advancements in silk production that nurtured the fashion system. Specialized silk production took place in official workshops, private urban, private urban workshops, and weaving households. Silks excavated from cities along the Silk Road and elite tombs in the inner empire show a dazzling array of patterns that highlight the ingenuity of the weaver, as you see here in a textile fragment um, featuring pheasants and pearl roundels that is now in the Los Angeles County Museum. Of the corpus of silk artifacts dated to the Tang Dynasty, polychrome silks, as you see as in this one, um, with a design consist consisting of a central pattern, such as animals or hunters encircled in a roundel border and combined with floral composite motifs in the interstices were the most innovative and fashionable and thus have commanded the most attention from textile historians. One example of this complex design structure is the banner featuring four lion hunters mounted on winged horses arranged symmetrically along a central axis, now preserved at the Horyuji Temple in Nara, Japan. Um, the textile is believed to have been woven in Tang, China and sent to Nara in the early 8th century. 
So what you're looking at is um, depicted in two tiers, four horsemen. Each of the horsemen are presented aiming a bow at a pouncing lion. And the upper tier, the horses are yellow green and bear the character for mountain shan on their hind quarters. The horses in the lower tier are indigo and feature the character ji or auspicious. There's a flowering tree that stands at the center of the medallion, the outer band of which is composed of 20 white pearls divided into four sections by a nested square positioned at the four cardinal points. Dispersed in between the rows of medallions are quatrefoil motifs combined with small pearl roundels enclosing a lotus flower woven in the center. This textile is remarkable for both pattern design and weaving technique, which places the textile in close relation to Sasanian ornament. Um, the complexity of this textile could only be achieved by advances made in weaving technique and in technology, a point that I will return to. Beginning in the sixth century, the medallion style classified as a series of repeated round quartered pattern units that frame an animal or human figure spread across the territories linked together by the Silk Road roots. The sheer quantity of similarly designed silks made with near identical techniques has made it challenging to discern unequivocally which fragments were woven by Tang artisans or by Sogdians or even by artisans from further west of the empire. The woven medallion design, similar to the Tang beauty found under trees, was a template adopted, adapted, and transformed by designers and weavers across and beyond the empire. So in this way, the medallion style or the roundel pattern offered a versatile framing, occasionally linking structure that could be customized in a myriad of ways and could be repeated on a complex loom. And so here you see a 9th or 10th century likely Sogdian produced um, garment with basing ducks in a pearl roundels, um, enclosed in pearl roundels. And here's a child's coat, possibly part of a set of uh, princely garments. Um, both the coat and the pants um, in the Cleveland Museum were lined with a ling tool damask pattern with a large scale floral medallion made up of a central rosette framed by two floral wreaths. Um, on Earth and Tibet, the garments illustrate the flexibility of ornament and more significantly, the portability of silk textiles design and technique during this era. The hybrid form and decoration of the coat and pants have suggested that the terms, um, that the items may have been patterned or produced within the Tibetan empire, which at the time extended into parts of Western China, specifically modern Sichuan and Gansu provinces and Turfan in modern Xinjiang in the, um, so in the late eighth century. Imperial expansion would have brought Tibetan elites in closer contact with goods made by Sogdian and Tang artisans in the newly conquered territories. One other point that I would just make as an aside is that the Tang um, historical archives are actually framing with anecdotes of weavers and other craftspeople as captured as booty during wars or incursions. So it's also likely that many of the weavers who were already living in Sichuan or Gansu at the time would have been incorporated into local workshops under the new regime. So a combination, as we see here, of stylistic, iconographic, and technical features has led textile specialists to conclude that the outer fabric of the coat was a with the design of paired ducks um, is of Sogdian origin. The pants and lining are believed to have been made by Chinese weavers. This evidence, however, is largely circumstantial and relies on style history. Um, in any case, that the pants, coat, and lining came to be fabricated from this combination of silks is in, it's, is in itself suggestive of the pathways that transported motifs 
patterning techniques and even artisans in a fashion system that was dispersed geographically across vast distance. And in this way, not, unluck, not unlike the gilt silver cups found in the Haja Twin Ford. So returning to Lady True's dancer, um, one problem remains, and which is that how weavers in Tong China came to produce designs that bear a striking likeness to decorative patterns found on stucco wall panels of Sassani Iran, for example, remains largely unknown. So here you have, you can see the roundel pattern on her top compared to the roundel pattern enclosing wings um, and the wall panel. The shared vocabulary of this medallion or roundel style was most likely sustained by frequent interactions through trade, diplomacy, and war, and was mediated by mobile populations living in the interstices. So Sogdian merchants and craftsmen who were from the Eastern Iranian speaking lands around Samarkand in modern day Uzbekistan had settled in the oasis towns along the Silk Road and they would have played a pivotal role in facilitating trade and in commissioning textile production between Tang China and the Sasanian Empire. But since weavers were not persons of interest to the compilers of Tang records, the history of weaving has been largely excluded from textual documentation. Um, changes in silk technology and weaving practice can only be reconstructed from the material artifact. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick kind of tutorial on textiles. I'm sorry if this is familiar to you already. Um, so a basic textile, um, and here you have two binding units, is woven on a loom of warp threads, binding parallel to the length of the loom and weft threads that are drawn perpendicular to the warp across the width of the loom. The weft threads are interlaced through the warp at a right angle to form a weave structure, also called a binding unit. So you see here the diagram of a plain weave or tabby, which is one warp over one weft and then under creating a crisscross pattern and a twill. So a warp over two or more wefts and then under one or more wefts creating a chevron pattern. A tabby or a twill weave can be developed into compound weaves with two or more series of warps and wefts. Warp face patterning refers broadly to the use of warp threads to create the patterns and weft based patterning refers to the use of weft threads to create the patterns. Silk textiles excavated from the region um, dated to the 6th through 8th centuries reveal one major shift in weaving technique, and that is the adoption of weft-based patterning technique in which supplementary sets of weft threads are inserted across the warp and used to produce the design. This is important because up until roughly the 6th century, complex silks were exclusively warp-based. Weft-faced compound tabbies and the more complex weft-faced compound twills woven with silk threads began to appear around the 6th century. In other words, the expanding range and quantity of decorated silks produced for the court and the larger empire were made possible by changes in how textile artisans wove and patterned, not just the surface appearance of textiles. Modifications in weaving in particular, although largely imperceptible to the user, were critical to the sheer abundance of complex silks with symmetrical designs that have survived from Tang China. Here's a bicolor twill um, that has a, features a primary motif of a peacock holding a knot of a ribbon in its beak, and it may have been part of a larger pattern unit, unit that included a facing peacock within a single medallion. In weft face patterning, as you see here, a weaver could use finer silk yarns, yielding more lustrous and delicate silks. This shift in the feel of silks would have been registered by the users as novel, but the cause of the shift may not have been self-evident to them. Innovations in weave structures were also, or they were largely dictated by the possibilities of the loom. Um, 
this is not a draw loom. I will get to this. But the re- invention of the draw loom was critical to the production of compound weave structures as it allowed the weaver to repeat the pattern unit in both warp and weft directions, allowing for the complex designs that we've looked at. From the surviving silk artifacts, a draw loom must have existed by the 7th century to allow for patterns to be repeated in two directions. Now there is... Um, as far as I know, still no consensus on where the draw loom originated. Multiple origins have been suggested, or nor is there an exact date for when it is um, first used in China. The loom shown here is a reconstruction of a model from a Han Dynasty burial site outside Chengdu in modern Sichuan, dated to the second half of the second century BCE. The find confirms that Han weavers in the Sichuan region used a complex loom with multiple pattern shafts for producing the polychrome warp-based compound tabby silks. The draw loom employed in Tang Dynasty workshops may have been derived from these early models. The absence of textual sources about looms in, in the Tang archive makes it difficult to determine whether the shift, in, shift to weft face patterning was spurred by mechanical invention, nor can we establish conclusively the reasons for the widespread adoption of weft-based patterning. What the sources do show is that the expansion of silk producing coincided with the shift from warp to weft-based, suggesting that weft-based patterning was a skill that weavers in both imperial and provincial workshops were able to learn quickly. And this is also confirmed by sumptuary legislation passed in this era. Um, so towards the, in the eighth century, there's a proliferation of weave types um, that document potentially the dissemination of technology from officially run workshops to privately run workshops. One motivation for the transition to weft phase patterning may have may be that it eased the design making process since stressing the loom required less time. Um, but I mentioned the technical aspects of weaving to emphasize that court demand and elite taste alone were insufficient to drive innovation in textile design, which depended on the capabilities of the loom and the knowledge of the weaver. Textile design in the case of the medallion style came about through sustained interaction between pattern and technique. In the eighth century, weavers used composite flowers, rosettes, or scrolling plants to compose the border in a style known as the treasure flower medallion pattern. Um, As in the pants and and jacket lining shown earlier. So on the right is a textile with floral medallion. The color is obtained from a lac dye, um, possibly cochineal, unlikely cochineal, um, but I will not debate. Um, on the left is a surviving fragment of a short sleeve top with treasure flower medallion pattern in the Imperial collections in Nara, Japan. It is sewn from two different folds, one with a red ground and one with a green ground. Um, so I thought I might start summing up. Uh, the ubiquity of the medallion style attests to the central role ornament, as we see here, played in exchanges between empires and their subjects, and also in the aesthetic plays of fashion. Within the context of imperial and elite display, ornament defined court culture and conveyed prestige and power. As surface decoration and a principle of style, Ornament could also intervene in the user's relationship to the object and with respect to the user's own social place and time. So um, to conclude, here is a textile with pearl roundels, um, which enclose a pair of dragons. In seizing the ornament of a distant cultural sphere and integrating into a local visual sphere of ornament, Patrons of luxury silks continually generated and enacted new images of themselves and of the world. In this case, Tang imperial power was related to its cosmopolitanism. This practice of meaning making performed through 
an encounter with the visual and material cultures of one's contemporary moment was also precisely the type of aesthetic play that underpinned the Tang fashion system. In short, silk ornament was a medium of cultural and social experience that opened up a world of symbolic, visual, and material possibilities that other modes of address could not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Puyin. Um, we have plenty of time for Q and A, and um, I open the floor. Everybody has a question the right way. Otherwise, maybe I'll um, I'll ask for you to clarify a little bit the interaction with of the understanding of what fashion was if, if everybody's sort of considering a Pearl Randall fashionable um, that, that leaves sort of little room for play or, or I don't know it seems like these Pearl Randalls were fashionable for several hundred years um, in, in this large time span is there is there a fluctuation that you see? Is that is that the, the fashion you're talking about? What what kind of changes um, are you talking about? Sure. Um, so I should perhaps sketch the broader argument of fashion that I made, um, which was motivated by a desire to disaggregate fashion from modernity, from an industrial modernity. Um, and to think about fashion in a non-modern, non-Western context. Which means to place fashion, which of course is always correlated with change, um, but to detach it from histories that emphasized, for example, fashion, or has equated fashion with changes in silhouettes. So fashion history is also often called hemline history because of its focus on um, shifts in shapes and silhouettes. Um, and I would argue that it is not possible to understand a garment without understanding its material substance. And so textiles um, is critical to every fashion system. The possibilities of a garment are first determined by the textile, its weight, um, its drape. And in the tongue, what the imperial, imperial expansion enabled an expansion of silk production of both plain and luxury textiles. And there is a great, as a result, there's a great source of anxiety about the textiles themselves because they are, they correspond to a shift in um, the social world in which hierarchy is no longer so attached to state sanctioned prestige, but is also attached to wealth and wealth was performed through the acquisition and wearing of textiles. So to us, for you know, the medallion pattern, as we see here, may seem quite formulaic. <coughs> and that may, but the, the, the range of uh, patterns that you find from excavated tongue silks, even though they exist in this template, uh, are quite varied, and so, well, the garments themselves didn't change significantly in terms of the shape, although we do see, um, for example, this figure, um, the slim figure, and the more voluptuous figures I showed at the beginning, there is a difference in the pictorial representation of the dress that suggests that silhouettes may have also changed. Um, but the main locus of change was in textile design. Um, and part of my argument is that it is textiles because they allowed for, um, because they function as a template, especially this medallion style, that was, that was the primary vehicle by which change was registered. So looking at sixth century polychrome silks, are quite different from what had been dated to the 9th and 10th century. And that shift was also afforded by a shift in patterning techniques. So the later textiles I showed also are more illustrious. They're 
wider. Um, and that change would have been registered by users, too. And I think also that change is what accounts for the kind of drapery that you find in later pictorial representation. So there is a coherence between what is happening in the material world as, a, as well as what is happening in the pictorial world. Do, do you think that using paintings as a source for these kinds of patterns uh, uh, provides the same sort of pattern as using actual silk. Because you know? none of these show, for instance, those pearl rattles. There are a few that do. Oh, they, they are. No there problem. are a few that do. Um, but I don't use them as, uh, I don't use the paintings as kind of photographic evidence of changes in textile design. Um, I look at the paintings and think about how the paintings themselves were critical in expressing two town viewers change by itself. So the circulation of representations of the human change over time. And if we think about the visual world of the town empire, that shift in how these women are being depicted would have been registered to them as a change. So from a slim figure to a more voluptuous figure. Um, and what is what I love about these, these women under trees is that it's precisely because they are so again like the medallions you know, the template, but the manner of styling them was dependent on the painters themselves, and so in that way you can actually really see the manner of style of fashioning a Tom beauty as being commentary by the painter. Yeah, and I'm oh, sorry. I was interested in the last example you showed, so the double, the double descending dragon in, um, in a double pearl border, which is unusual, yes. um, and I assume it's probably quite late in, in the whole, whole story. Um, I'm a little curious why um, more credit wasn't given to the Sogdians and the whole issue of Central Asian trade coming from Iran, uh, the Sasanian silk industry, which was so major, um, to the Sasanian economy, just as it was to China, um, and uh, very important in terms of imperial gift exchange and so on. Uh, these were major tokens and expressions of diplomatic recognition. Um, so um, much of the repertoire which we see uh, often found in the Central Asian context and described as Tang Chinese are almost certainly, in fact, um, uh, Iranian. Um, and so and I think that dialogue needs to be explored a little more um, in terms of, uh, we have examples of uh, classic pearl uh, board round owls um, in large format um, silk um, um, weave uh, textiles which have um, part of the inscriptions woven into the borders. Um, so there's no ambiguity about where they were made. Uh, they clearly late Sasanian or immediately post Sasanian, 7th or 8th century, um, and they're existing in that, that, that world, um, intersecting in, um, as you say, probably Tibetan controlled uh, Tarim Basin region at that time. Um, so I, I think those dynamics come into play rather more than perhaps you presented in your presentation. Sure, and they certainly do, um, but my focus is more on the later part of the Tarim Empire, where it will damasks and Mongolia dominant, uh, which is not, which is related to the shift in self-production to the south of the empire, uh, and it has to do with the frontier expansion. expansion and, I mean, ex frontier expansion for yourself, but the border of uh, contracting in the west. Um, so the booming of the maritime economy. Well, less so the booming of the maritime economy, but so mainly I've looked at records of, um, from the 9th century of silks that were being produced in the Jano area, which tended to be um, this more lightweight tool of Damas. Um, and that tends to the shift to the south, you know, is part of kind of a long narrative of the Chinese history of the Jano transition, which I will not recount. Um, but the shift to the south is important for silk production because you also find it not only represented in texts and tribute records, but also in poetry being composed about silk production, about some textiles. Um, and so I completely agree that the Sogdians play a significant role in the early 
towards the late 8th, 9th century, their role in, as intermediaries, both as artisans and merchants, um, significantly declined. Mm -hmm. oh, we see this at the Golden Soul production movement from shifting from Chang'an to Hangzhou and these southern coastal, you know, very prosperous mercantile communities as opposed to imperial. Right. I mean, is, shouldn't this part of the same pattern, is it? Or? Definitely. And, and then you have more local elite patronage. So, you know, what's striking thing about Tang century legislation is that there's this moment, you know, in the mid-8th um, century where the court goes to great lengths to specify specific leave types. And by the end of the dynasty, sumptuary law is just state we ban all new styles, suggesting that they actually have no longer sustained control over the types of new leaves that are being produced. Um, you showed us a lot of great um, images on fashion. On fashion. Um, I am just curious about how frequent and detailed um, is fashion represented in Tang Dynasty literature, and how do you make of them? So um, I spent a lot of time reading <laughs> Poetry, which is not my favorite thing. <laughs> um, the line that I well, one of what is remarkable about Tom poetry is all of the ways in which um, later Tom poets like Bakri played with the notion of time, um, and so much of my work has been reading through his European or music European music bureau poetry. And even here, in this line um, excerpt, so what I've translated as keep up with the times in Chinese, a little, a little translation would be to enter time. So the idea is that time becomes a space that can be inhabited. Um, then this idea, notion of time spans quite a few, um, or belongs to this new vocabulary that you find in ninth century poetry, suggesting that, you know, awakened by perhaps the disruption of Anshan, um, these poets, the breakdown of the administration of the Tang Dynasty, these poets are really thinking about historical consciousness. And so you have all of this nostalgia through the Roman era and this um, playing with different ways of articulating time. And Bajir is most famous for a couple of his uh, European poems that talk about um, and its relationship, its direct relationship to politics, and these poems were intended to be pedantic. So that's how we read the literature. Thank you. Um, did the Tang elites uh, view calligraphy as the most eminent art form? And, and if so, where does textile production fit into the hierarchy, at least from the Tang elite perspective? Um, of, say, ceramic production, painting, and other forms of artistic expression. Were, were, were some of them more utilitarian, viewed as more utilitarian, and thus not preeminent as art? They definitely wouldn't have been considered art, although, so I, um, the few records of men who would have produced textiles. Um, exist across a few sources. And one of these men, um, Dou Shuwen, who is in included in the first art historical work, Indeed of the World, um, a record of successive cultures um, by Zhang Yanyuan. He includes this person who held a minor office and is known, is recorded for having designed some textiles, in particular, medallion style. So the record trying to remember, mentions that he designed textiles of confronting rams, etc., etc. And so by including him in this record of painters, textile production, textile design, at least, not the making, not the weaving, the design itself, right? the, pat, the surface appearance of the textile, is likened to painting. Um, this is the only instance that I have found but it would have generally not been considered art. Um, and part, one of my arguments about against kind of the emphasis on design as this modern way of thinking of intention that deployed onto form, which is how painters and this particular figure, this particular textile designer, the Thomas narrator, 
doesn't account for how many of the changes in technique would have been worked up within the space of the workshop by weavers themselves. Um, so I'm trying to shift away from a modern understanding of a design process to focusing on what may have actually transpired in a workshop space that doesn't focus so much on the so-called designer. So they were artisans, not artists. Yes, and some of them were just women who wove. <laughs> But this is highly distinguished from ceramic production, which is much more technical and, and, and like baking is to boiling an egg. You have to really follow precepts and, and sequences. And it, it's, I, can you distinguish between textile production and ceramic production in that way? I mean, or is it, is it the same? The same as in, as in its task-based? task and process and um, it's complexity. It's the same, but I, as I heard your question is about perception of whether or not textile production is as complex as ceramic or other craft production. So there's one um, record of, or there, one entry into this question is um, how the Tang government, the Tang state understood trade. And this, there were, Cross people that were directly managed by the Tom state and directly trained by the Tom state. And the complexity of the craft determined the length of time, length of training time. So gold and silver is at the top of craft. Textiles is good. Gold and silver, I think, is more in three to four years of training. And textiles, I believe, and, this, and it's very vague, is a few months. Um, another entry point into this are um, penal codes for what happens when textile artisans produce contraband textiles. Punishment is doled out according to level of participation in the weaving process. So the person who sets up the loom, someone we may call a kinta designer, receives the highest level of punishment, three years exile. Um, and then, it, and then, you know, the person, the draw boy, receives like thirty lashings or something. I can't remember what the specific is. So it is, I mean, the Tom State understood it as very task based and processual, but in terms of how it perceived the complexity of its production as compared to other crops, there was a significant difference. Does that answer your Yes, question? thank you. So, um, and in this quote here, is the speaker talking about gin, the gold brocade? Oh, uh, so it's a it's a translation of a textile term that is used to refer to polychrome textiles. There's no English equivalent, so I just leave it as it's in its romanized form. So it's not a gold textile; it's just a polychrome a compound complex textile. Oh, I've seen gin used to refer to the small scale gold brocade designs but, associated right, so with. That, that's not the term here. That's Thank right. you. Uh, could you um, speak quickly to gender? Were the same rules for male and female? There was a lot of sort of, um, you know, were there patterns? And I know there's some sort of laws that sort of indicated the height and uh, rank and status. But um, um, a couple of the figures that you showed, um, I would have thought would have been identified as male and yet you identified them as female, so I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so, like these figures, perhaps these... Yeah, the stand they attended as well. Yeah. I mean, they're mainly... The classification mainly depends on, on their facial features. So, and according to... I mean, according to some archaeologists, smallness of feet, although I'm not entirely certain about that. Um, so there is, within the Tang dress system, women of rank, so women either as mothers of officials or as daughters of officials or married to officials, their dress are supposed to roughly coincide with that of their husbands. And it's, the system is infinitely different. Um, 
there are then the these tre the treatises on characters and dress, which is a compilation of the dress code along with um, anecdotes and transgression, as well as um, some Sharia laws that are being extended in the past. Um, the majority of the attention is paid to them. Now we can read this in a number of ways. Does, does that mean that men never transgress? Um, probably not. But women, because they were not so, their public body was not so bound to the town state, in some ways we can understand that they have more fluidity in, um, in being subversive and the manner they trust. So the compilers of the dynastic annals in particular were very upset about what we see as cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. Women dressing up as men or women dressing up as foreigners. Um, and whether or not it was, I mean, the way I interpret this critique in the dynastic annals is that what the moralizing compilers are most upset about is a practice of dressing in which our representation of the self is severed from any continuity with the body underneath. And so, and this, in a way, is how we understand fashion more broadly, is this idea that what one wears on the outside is not necessarily representative of the social, political, corporate identity of that underneath. And so, in this way, women occupy a very conspicuous place in the fashion system as being consistently written about um, and also depicted in funerary figurines as well as in um, paintings. Um, I just, can I have a follow-up on this one? Is this particularly uh, relevant during this again that they or is this a it's relevant throughout the dynasty, but it's so it is linked after the fact to Zetian, um that because they, the practice of cross dressing, so called, becomes read as an omen for what is about to befall the dynasty. A social upheaval, women dressing as men, women becoming, you know, finding their own dynasties. Um, in the same way, that the voluptuous Tang beauty is equated with that of Yang Guifei. But depictions of voluptuous women, like the depictions of women cross-dressing pre-date and post-date, both Yang Guifei and Zetian. So the visual material archive does not align with the historical, I mean, the textual one. Mm -hmm. Oh, 15 minutes ago or so, I think I understood you to say that at one point towards, well, let's say, the end of the regime, they said, we forbid new designs. Was that the idea that new designs equals free thought and we don't want so much free thinking just now? Um, no, I don't think it had to do with ideas so much as the migration of resources away from state control into more private hands. Because silk, silk production was key to the empire, um, both as, because, I mean, silk was used along with other textiles as in this multi-currency world. Um, and it was important to, for diplomatic exchanges. And so, in theory, the state had a monopoly on silk production. Um, and new design might break that monopoly or threaten it? Well, new designs hints that the state, in fact, doesn't have a monopoly oh. because they have to just kind of broadly identify new styles as something to be banned. Um, so it's a shift from a state that has seems to have a very clear sense of the styles being produced outside of state workshops to a state that has no idea what is being produced. I have, I have one more question. Um, so you talked about weaves a lot. Is there um, are your issues applying also for embroidery work? Just a little bit differently individual. 
I don't focus, I don't work on embroidery. So the other pattern technique that I'm interested in this period is the development of cloud basis dyeing, which speeds up the patterning process. Um, embroidery is, I chose not to focus on embroidery. <laughs> Um, to the, the, speaking of the resist dyeing, um, I've always read that there's a, a nice linkage between um, the, the ceramics designs and, and resist dyeing. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, it's. Your thoughts? There definitely, I, I would argue that there probably is an all likelihood, especially if you look, um, there are these figurines um, with appliques and dry resist dyeing with three, the tri colored places. Um, and, and this is, you know, another piece of really interesting intermediality, um, where there are also excavated skirts showing the same persimmon pattern, also basis dyed. Um, as far as I know, there are practices of different forms of basis dye that extend further back. Um, so it could be that textiles formed, the textiles predated more because they're also on human figurines, that the resist dyeing is really on the figurines may have been more related to, or textiles may have been the, what's the word I'm looking for, inspiration mm -hmm. for that, for what you find on top um, figurines. Right, because my understanding is ceramicists use similar techniques, they use wax. Right. Yeah. So there's wax edge ash and yeah. other resists that are being I have two uh, questions. So question one is that you mentioned a lot about the production of the silks. So have you ever uh, run across some materials dealing with the, uh, how the town people they would dispose the used or uh, worn up garments uh, at the period? So are they going to reuse the fabric they cut up, you know, to, to repurpose the fabric? So. Yes. So um, this figurine, she, her body is made from a wooden frame, and then her arms are rolls of used paper that are from a pawn shop that was located in the capital. And the pawn shop, or the slips from the pawn shop, include the sale of garments. So garments were often sold in pawn shops and reused. So that's one way. That's one of the uses um, textile that we. Evidence for. The other is the circulation of um, textiles produced for tax within the empire that then make its way into the western regions. And so there are excavated silks with um, inscriptions from the collection of stamping of the tax, of the tax official of the Republic. Um, and then we made it, for example, bedding or skirts. It's likely that, I mean, textiles circulated not just as newly made products, but also circulated within, you know, through these up, these used vendors or pawn shops within the capital. So uh, my second question is that so a lot of the examples you've shown uh, in the uh, this kind of uh, uh, in this lecture are uh, probably kind of uh, in imperial kind of court related. Uh, fancy textiles, right? So I'm wondering what kind of textiles that the ordinary town people they would they can buy, they can purchase uh, in the market, and what type of the textiles they're going to use to make their the, the civilians or the ordinary kind of the costumes. Um, so they would have been plain silk or baby mop. I mean, hemp or some kind of product. They may have been dyed. Probably many of them were undyed. We only have a sense of what these plain textiles look like um, from tax textiles, which would have been woven largely by women in the household, who would have also woven the garments for the household. Um, and for, I mean, the other, we don't, I mean, it's hard to know about, to think about markets in which these, in which silk textiles are purchased, for most commoners, they would have, um, Worn silks that were or textiles that were woven at home, um, and I'm trying to find here. And I mean, these are plain, not simple, but these are plain silk textiles, monochrome textiles. Um, 
the dyeing was an expense because you had to, because botanicals or insect based dyes were uh, commodities. I mean, they had to be procured, and not many families would have been able to do so. So, definitely, so uh, at the time, at the period, the dyed silk or even the silk is a luxury, right? It's not for the ordinary people, right? It's only the rich people can afford at that time. And we can't say definitively, but yes, publicly. Oh, okay. Um, did dyeing, um, were, are, were all of the dyes used in the Tang period uh, locally sourced, or were there foreign dyes imported into the empire for production purposes? There were local and also imported dyes and pigments. Um, I don't know, I mean, so safflower and indigo would have been local dyes, uh, dye stuffs. Uh, the purple textile from the mat that I showed, um, this is believed to be cochineal, though I'm not sure what the pathway for cochineal can be in. Um, so I assume that it's a, a lock dye, and that could have been sourced for the Western frontier or the Western regions. So the Romans, for example, during the antique period in Rome, they would have gotten plain silk from China and then dyed them themselves? Or, I mean, did, pe did people in foreign markets receiving uh, silks from China, were they already dyed, or could they have been dyed locally by whoever received them for? They would have been dyed probably. I mean, I, I assume, I don't, I actually, I don't know about the Roman side of the market. Um, but it's unlikely, aside from silk, plain silk use yeah. for currency, it would be unlikely that they would have brought, purchased large, num large bolts of, or large numbers of bolts of plain silk textiles. But I, I, I don't know. I have two very quick questions. One is that you mentioned that uh, textile, especially silk, uh, circulated to the Western region and was used as a currency or payment. Um, I remember Osteim has a, he, he wrote an article on uh, testing the, there was a standardized um, measure of um, uh, the textile uh, which was used in the hand on Western region. Was that also the case with the term um, silk? And as used as currency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were a few attempts to, because it would, the um, equivalent of silk to copper coins, for example, mm -hmm. or other forms of currency that circulated within this period had to be standardized repeatedly. So there wasn't just one standard, but it mm -hmm. would fluctuate according to information. So there were edicts that were um, issued to assign, depending on inflation, not just lengths of silk, but also types of silk. So types of silk we use. And the second question is about the pharmacy assemblage, which is a uh, imperial clay. And um, as far as I can remember, there were two uh, silk. Um, one was being used as uh, to be wrapping mm -hmm. the misets silk and the other one. Um, so part of the um, patterns was um, like printed mm -hmm. on the outside of a bowl, and the other one was used uh, to be uh, wrapping the reliquary. Really and none of them has any um, Sasanian or Saudian motif. And there is the um, behavior of the a clothing for dedicated to the uh, to the, so and was um, embroidery with gold threads. Right. So, um, so the, the inventory is date is later. Uh, right. Okay. And so this is right. so the textile that you see in that in the, in the inventory itself, the list, mm -hmm. reflects the shifts in atomic self production. So there's a particular type of complex gauze. Then mm -hmm. um, there is there are a lot of these tulip damas that are in that inventory, and that speaks to the shift in production. 
um, one place in Sichuan, one place in, in modern Zhejiang province. There's also a Zetian skirt, which hasn't been published yet. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, last question. Yeah, regarding the garment that I think a couple times you shared you thought it was tied with cochineal. This one. This one, I guess my understanding is that cochineal is indigenous etymologically to the Americas. So can you tell me a little more why? I, I don't, I'm not saying that it's cochineal. This is what, um, this is at the Met, and as I understand the that is identified as a as cochineal. So. And, and I like your um, connection with technique in fashion. So why were you emphasizing that color? You know, regardless if it's cochineal or something else, I think you heard it. I heard you emphasize it, the dye a couple of times. So what stood out to you about that? Um, I was... I don't think I emphasized it in my talk. I was responding to questions about the dye, the color itself. I mean, color is significant insofar as um, I stated earlier about the relationship between cost, right? The cost of dyeing itself and using what are not common pigments or dye stuffs. And there have been, I mean, these excellent articles in the literature the 60s on pigments um, and the significance of color in the greater Tom world, not just in terms of textiles or painting, but also in alchemy, et cetera. Yeah, I'm aware of that significance. I was just curious about what you knew about this piece and why the cochineal association. So thank you. All right, thank you again.